All right, we're back at this slide with the windows closed. I think that guy with the chainsaw is just cutting up a whole cord of wood tonight. So what else are you gonna do on a Saturday night during the time of COVID-19? Uh, anyways, um, and in summer too. So I guess it's for firewood in the winter or something. Uh, I'm getting distracted, so <laughs> I'll just go back to this. We've got sort of three different velar articulations here. And you can hear the different vowels in each of them. So the velars, the velars are happening at slightly different places in each case, and they're going to lead to slightly different formant transitions in each each case as well. Um, so this is kind of a really important moment in the history of the development of speech perception theory. Uh, because, like I said, people were trying to figure out what was going on um, acoustically when listeners hear these sounds and like try to understand what is being said in them. And they looked at velars in particular and said, well, there's kind of no consistency acoustically in what we consider to be velars when we listen to English. Um, and kind of the leap they made is that, well, if there's no consistency at the acoustic level, then maybe the acoustics are not that important to how we actually hear things in speech. And the jump they made was that if they're not, that the acoustics isn't that important, then maybe it's the articulations. Assuming basically that something we call a K or a velar stop is somehow consistent articulatorily across the board. Even though when you do look at how these things are actually produced, they're slightly different in slightly different places in each case, but we still consider them all to be a K. But that sort of disconnect provided the foundation for the phenomenon we're gonna investigate next. Uh, so just to wrap up this portion of the lecture, I'll give you kind of all three places of articulation in one slide. This is me saying, a bab, a dad, a gag, those three, whatever's uh, in a row. So you can see for the buh, we get formant trans transitions down into the stop um, closure on both sides of this vowel a, a bab, which conveniently has high F1 and high F2. For a dad, a dad, uh, F2 is gonna point up a little bit for these guys. Like I said, a usually starts out as an a, a dad, and then kind of goes down to a schwa. So this one points up maybe a little bit more here at the end. Um, yeah. Uh, F1, by the way, is normally going to go down for most of these articulations, uh, just across the board. A gag. You get more information about different places of articulation from F2. And then for the gag. A gag. Uh, you can kind of see F2 and F3 coming together on both sides of each stop um, to give you that. A gag. Velar pinch. Uh, so this one add maybe a little bit fronter a gag. So you'd expect F2 to go up a little bit more for that one. Um, okay, so also like I said, uh, I played you those examples of sort of the stop, vowel, stop sequences with only the vowels in the middle, including the transitions, but without the stops on either side. And you can more or less figure out what's being said in those words, even though you don't hear it all. Um, so when people started noticing the importance of formant transitions in the 50s, they tried to figure out how can we test this theory to find out whether or not it's true. So in the 50s, they uh, were working from scratch basically. They had a spectrogram on the one, or a spectrograph on one side where that could take acoustic signals and kind of decode them into their various frequency components. Uh, they wanted to sort of be able to control what transi transitions people were hearing, one out of 11 what transitions people were hearing um, so they can test like what transitions correspond to which uh, sort of stop percepts in speech perception. And in order to do that, they had to create a device again from scratch that they called the pattern playback. So this emerged from Haskins Labs, which works in to this day in New Haven, Connecticut, which is also where Yale is found. So they're not really, Haskins is not really part of Yale, but I, I think they're associated, but at least they're close to each other in geographical space. Um, and this uh, this created a this these this series of experiments uh, created a very highly influential theory of speech perception called the motor theory of speech perception. So how did this work? So basically, this is a spectrograph in reverse, um, and what they started off with was a clear sheet of cellophane on which they had painted. 
uh, formant patterns that look like the formant patterns we see in a spectrogram. So this is a clear sheet of cellophane and they painted in white paint on top of that very carefully by hand. Uh, and then what they did is they took a light source of some uh, form and they sort of projected that light source at a mirror which sort of bent the light over so that it could shine through this clear uh, piece of cellophane but it wouldn't shine through the painted versions so basically that was um, enough to sort of provide the pattern the formant pattern to a series of light collector cells down here on the bottom which would respond uh, with different sort of amounts of voltaic output uh, or electrical output based on how much light was shining in them. So they're photovoltaic cells, which conveniently have this property. Uh, so the light collectors would sort of respond to the amount of light shown at them, and they were connected, uh, or their electrical output was connected to an amplifier, which would basically reproduce uh, frequencies that these light collectors were tuned to uh, with varying intensities depending on how much light was shown into, into the photo, photovoltaic cells. So uh, in this kind of amazing fashion you could go from just light and a painted spectrogram on a piece of cellophane to what sounded sort of like speech. Uh, and this is kind of the basic first speech synthesizer, speech, speech synthesizer ever produced. Uh, and it's known as the pattern playback because this is the pattern they uh, painted on the cellophane and they just were able to play it back. Okay, and this is what it looked like in reality. Uh, like I said, this is like cellophane and they're painting these formant patterns on top of it. Um, and like I said, this is basically the first speech synthesizer. It, you know, it involved a lot of uh, work that you actually had to paint these things by hand uh, very carefully to get what sounded like speech. So it's not as sophisticated as the speech th synthesizers we're used to today. And um, you may or may not be able to decipher what it says, but I will give you a shot at it um, based on some samples which are um, still posted to this day on the Haskins Labs website. So here we go. Here's try number one. Can you tell me what's being said here? These days, my um, I've done this in class a long time. Uh, usually the first time through, there's a few people who get about half of that. And then the more times we play it, uh, eventually it starts to uh, emerge for everybody. These days, is a rare dish. Uh, but when you listen to it, you might notice that it's kind of easier to pick up the vowels than whatever consonants are around them. And looking at this thing, you can kind of figure out why, right? So this is most this is a two-format pattern for all these to begin with. Uh, but if you're trying to paint consonants on this thing, they're going to wind up looking like this, whatever this is. Maybe it's a release burst or, you know, frication or something like that. It's harder to paint that um, because it's more random, basically, than um, a vowel format frequency. So that is saying these days a chicken leg is a rare dish, which another thing that doesn't help there is that that is not something that people normally say on a regular basis. So it's kind of a low frequency statement. Um, and that's going to be harder for you to kind of decipher uh, than something more common. These days, a chicken leg is a rare dish. And once you hear one and know what it says, it starts to become a little bit easier to hear the rest or understand what the rest say too. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. But that one might not be super easy. We can listen to it a couple more times. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. What he's saying there is, it's easy to tell the depth of a well. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Uh, again, maybe they said that more often in the 50s than they do now. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll ask my dad someday. Four hours of steady work face us. Play that one a couple times. Four hours of steady work face us. And this one has a lot of uh, voiceless obstruents in it, so those are not easy to reproduce with this system. Um, and they might be hard for you to pick up as well, but we'll give it one more shot. Four hours of steady work faced us. But what he's saying is four hours of steady work faced us. Four hours of steady work. Four hours of steady work faced us. Okay, that is the pattern playback. <laughs>
So that uh, provided kind of the foundation for the first real fleshed out theories of how speech perception, perception worked. And the way they used it to test their theories of speech perception um, is they designed this uh, experimental paradigm, uh, which led to our understanding of a phenomenon known as categorical perception. So they had these two formant stimuli and they painted them on that piece of cellophane in these patterns. So like I said, uh, normally for most stops, F1 is going to go down into the stop closure. Uh, and they also painted uh, closure voicing for that stop here at the bottom. So all these are gonna sound like voice stops or should sound like voice stops. And the only thing that changes in this sort of continuum is what F2 is doing. And like I said, you normally get more information for stop place of articulation out of F2 than any other form of transition. This one is pointing down a lot. This one is pointing down not quite as much, so on and so forth until we get to zero where it's just kind of flat. And then it starts, F2 starts to point up as you go through the scale, uh, eventually to uh, plus six here where it's pointing up a lot. And the idea is that if it's pointing down you sh into the stop closure, you should get more of a buh or bilabial percept. If it's just flat, and this is, I think this is the vowel ah, uh, so this is kind of a relatively high F2, but not super high. So this kind of straightforward F2 transition should give you something like a da percept. And then if it's pointing up high, this is sort of like what we get for that velar pinch where F2 goes up. So this one should sound like a velar over here. You can tell me what you think, or you can at least tell yourself or your cat or your kid sister, whatever, um, what you think you hear here. Uh, but let's give it a whirl. So if you're like me, you do you hear a bilabial here, uh, alveolar there, and a velar here. It's not the greatest form of speech ever, but it's kind of kicking off the right percepts in our heads, right? Okay, so what do we mean by categorical perception? So again, this is based on sort of the that kernel of an insight with the velar stops in English, where we're kind of seeing different acoustic patterns for velar stops, and it's all leading to the same percept at the end where we get different acoustic patterns, the same phonological category in our minds when we're listening to them. Uh, categorical perception, you can define it as where you perceive continuous physical distinctions or continuous acoustic distinctions in discrete categories. So we know, well, at least the phonologists tell us that when we speak or when we listen to speech, we kind of boil everything down into these phonemic categories like ba, da, or ga. But when we look at the way speech is actually implemented or manifests itself in physical reality, we see these fine-grained acoustic distinctions, these fine-grained articulatory distinctions all over the place, right? What categorical perception says is that we take those continuous acoustic distinctions and we kind of draw lines at some point in the continuum to break them up into discrete phonological categories. So, in the in-class experiment, which again, you should have done before watching this lecture, there are 11 different syllable stimuli <clears throat> that differed only in the locus of their F2 transition. And I got these uh, stimuli from a website which kind of had updated this uh, experimental paradigm and produced better versions of synthetic speech in order for us to sort of hear this a little more easily. When they did that, their F2 locus range was about 725 hertz on the low end and 2200 something hertz on the high end. That's where kind of the F2 cut off as it went into the stop closure. Um, yeah, that's where I got it from. I haven't checked in a long time if it's still there, but I'm very glad that it was when I needed it. So thank you again, Swedish phoneticians. Uh, here's what they look like in spectrogram four. And like I said, if F2 is pointing down, you're probably gonna hear a bilabial stop blah, like that. Blah. If F2 is relatively flat or pointing to around like 1600 hertz, you're probably going to hear a da. da. Uh, and these vowels are ah here rather than ah. And then if it's pointing up, F2 is pointing up so much that it almost meets up with F3, even though F3 doesn't go down, this should sound to you sort of like a ga. Ga. So. Ba. Da. Ga. And again, it's synthetic speech, so it's not perfect. 
Obviously, it's not sounding like a natural human voice to us, but the value of this is that we can control exactly what the formant transitions are doing. Uh, and so we can know if they're at exactly this part of the frequency space, what sort of percept people are going to get out of that when they listen to it. <clears throat> okay, so the idea with categorical perception, again, is that we somehow have to relate a physical world that doesn't have any sort of clear boundaries in it, um, which is gradiently changing on frequency scales or in particular places of articulation in our mouth, um, to a world inside our head where there are clear category boundaries. So the idea behind this, the way people interpreted um, the results of these categorical perception experiments is that, well, within one frequency range, we'll hear everything as a ba. And there's sort of no meaningful differences between different tokens of ba. And within another frequency range, and these correspond to our different transitions in the um, synthetic stimuli that we've created, everything's going to sound like a DAW, and no DAWs will sound different from each other. Uh, there's kind of these transition points where it gets a little bit fuzzy, but basically we have three clear categories of BA, DA, GA. This is the data from the identification half of this task, where you simply listen to a token and say, uh, well, that's category BA or DA or GA, and this shows you what the different um, stimuli are here on the horizontal dimension or the x-axis. Uh, corresponding to what their formant transitions were doing. Okay, uh, this shows you what the data looked like from the discrimination half of this task, where you were saying I, where you were hearing two different stimuli and had to decide whether they were the same or different. Um, I'm giving you the data from the original study, uh, and the original study didn't use the same exact discrimination task that we did in class. So I boiled it down to something a little bit simpler for you guys because it's not that exciting of a task to begin with. It's kind of hard as well to hear the differences between the stimuli. Uh, so for you, you just have what is called an AX discrimination task, where you heard one sound and then you heard a mystery sound number two X, and you have to decide whether they're the same or different. Um, in the original task, they use what is called ABX discrimination, which is kind of discrimination and kind of identification as well, because the way it works is you hear sound one, ba, you hear sound two, da, and then you hear sound three, ba, and you have to decide, well, is x the same as a, or is x the same as b? And if it's ba, da, ba, then x lines up better with a, so you say, well, it's the first one. Um, so when you are doing this, if you get a really nice, clear distinction in these first two, like ba, da, and then ba, it should be relatively easy for you to pick out which of the first two stimuli X matches up with. Um, so if you're going across category boundaries in your stimuli, you should be able to get 100% discrimination. If you're within a category though, in the first two stimuli, and you get something like da, 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 then it becomes extremely difficult. And in terms of the results, you should see basically 50% correct responses for within category um, stimuli. So if you just hear da, 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 when you hear that third da, you just have to kind of guess which of the first two da's it matches up with, and you ideally pick one of those at random. If you hear a different category for each of these first two, it's super simple for you to sort of pick which category the third one lines up with. So um, this, is how they presented the results of this discrimination task in the original study. This is called two-step discrimination, which means that say if the value of the A stimulus is uh, stimulus number three, then the value of the B stimulus is gonna be five. Um, so maybe that goes across category, maybe it doesn't. In this particular case, it does, because we're getting basically 100% discrimination across those category boundaries. If I look at say five for the A stimulus and seven for the B stimulus, then I get a result like this of about 50% discrimination. So that's what you kind of get when you're between or within a category. So you're comparing five and seven here in that second case, and you're comparing three and five in that first case. So we're going between category boundaries for this one, we get 100% discrimination. 
and we're going within a category boundary for this pair and we get basically 50% discrimination. In practice, what categorical perception means though, is that we should be able to go from this identification data and use that the responses from this part of the task to predict the results of the discrimination task. So if we know that like 100% of the time people are hearing stimulus three as ba, and 100% of the time they're hearing stimulus five as da, then we could just say, well, every time they hear stimulus three, it's ba, every time they hear stimulus five, it's da, and then when they hear one of those again, if they hear stimulus three again as ba, they should match it up with the first stimulus ba 100% of the time. If they hear stimulus five and stimulus seven as da every single time, we can predict that they will not be able to hear the difference between those two because we kind of get rid of those fine grain acoustic details and just give this a label as da. Then they're gonna get 50% on this discrimination task. In practice, categorical perception means the discrimination function, this function, can be determined or calculated from the identification function. When you do identification, that's the same thing you do when you're just perceiving speech in general. You hear some acoustically complex creature in the speech world and you give it a label like ba, da, or ga, and you plop it into some hardcore, easily or clearly defined category. And you use those category labels to do the discrimination task as well. Hopefully that makes sense, but this is kind of what is at the crux of the matter for this concept of speech perception that you can predict discrimination from identification. So this winds up being what the homework is about, is learning how to use the identification function so that you can predict discrimination in categorical perception. Um, and so to help you with that task, I'm gonna walk you through an example where you use the identification data or some theoretical identification data to predict what the discrimination curve should look like. Okay, so if you don't understand what I'm talking about yet, um, I guess I would recommend that you walk through these mathematical computations with me at least once. And then if it's still fuzzy, walk through the whole thing again, right from the beginning from where I talk about what conceptually categorical perception means. Um, this is not super simple, but you should be able to get it because ultimately the math isn't that hard, uh, but I'm not gonna say it's gonna be easy the first time around. So let's consider a case where we have two sounds in a discrimination pair that are the same. And I'm gonna walk you through how to do this based on the task that we did in class or that you should have done at home before you watch these lecture notes. So this is AX discrimination, where you just hear two sounds rather than three, and you're deciding whether those two sounds are the same or different. So let's say that our two sounds are exactly the same, where you hear stimulus three followed by stimulus three. Okay, so we look at the identification data, and this is not the exact identification data that you will play around with in the homework. It's just idealized data to kind of help you understand how this process works. So like most things in human behavior, our performance is not absolutely perfect every single time. So when we hear stimulus three, let's say listeners hear that as a ba 95% of the time and as a da 5% of the time. So what we want to be able to calculate here is how many times are people actually going to perceive stimulus three followed by stimulus three as the same sound. Um, because they're not hearing it as ba 100% of the time, there is going to be some leeway there where sometimes they'll hear the two exact same stimuli one after the other as different from each other. So our options here in terms of what's going on in listeners' heads is that sometimes they will hear both of these stimuli as ba. That will happen when the first one is perceived as a ba, and that happens 95% of the time. And then also the second one is perceived as a ba. That will happen 95% of the time as well. To calculate the overall probability of that happening, 
we calculate the product of those two independent probabilities. So you multiply 95% by 95% and you get 0.9025 or 90.25%. You can use a calculator to do that as well. The other option for same a response of same in this particular case is in the sort of less likely case where they hear both stimulus threes as da. Each one will be perceived as a da 5% of the time. So what we do is we take 5% of the time for this first response, multiply that by 5% of the time for the second response, multiply those two independent probabilities together, we get an overall percentage of 0 0.0025. That's the probability the percentage is 0.25%. Okay. There's a couple of other options in there. I'm gonna pause here and just mention that the way you calculate the overall probability of perceiving these two stimuli as the same is that you add these two possibilities together. Um, so in 90.25% of the cases, you will hear ba and ba as the same. In 0.25% of the cases, you'll hear da and da as the same. They both wind up giving same responses in the end, even though you're hearing the stimuli as different um, phonemic categories. But you add those probabilities together and you get 90.5%. If you think about it, the other possibilities are that you might hear stimulus one as a ba, stimulus two as a da, or you could hear stimulus one as a da and stimulus two as a ba. But in both of those cases, you would be giving different responses. You could work out the math in the same way. So in that case, you get 0.95 times 0.05. I can't remember exactly what that equals, 0.04 or something. Uh, and then in the other case, it would, the math would wind up the same way. Instead, you'd be multiplying 0.05 times 0.95. That would give you 0 .9, um, 0 0.04 or something. You don't actually need to do the math for that because uh, it kind of is implicit in the result of this calculation. So if you know out of 100% how many times people are giving same responses, the percentage of time that they're giving different responses is just 100% minus this total. <clears throat> so 100% minus 90.5% is 9.5%. And now that I've done that calculation, I can tell you that each of these individual different calculations would be 4.75% because they, when you double that, that equals 9.5%. So you just need to do one half of this, which makes your job a little bit simpler. And I'll show you as well what it looks like when the two sounds in a discrimination pair are different. And I'll do this with stimulus nine followed by stimulus 11. And in this case, we're looking at different response categories, but the math should work out in a similar fashion. So uh, what we wanna figure out here is how many times or what percentage of time are these stimuli going to be perceived as the same? So we have different percentages to begin with here because we're kind of crossing um, a category boundary and going from stimulus nine to stimulus 11. So stimulus nine we hear as da 80% of the time and as ga 20% of the time. Stimulus 11 is on the far end of the um, scale here. So we hear that as a da 5% of the time and as a ga 95% of the time. What we wanna see, we're calculating here is how often are these perceived as the same. So our two sort of same uh, response options will be based on a percept of da followed by a percept of da. That's one option. The other is a percept of ga followed by a percept of ga. So how often do we hear stimulus nine as a da? These are two different stimuli, so we're gonna get different percentages to multiply together in this case. Stimulus nine is heard as a da 80% of the time, and stimulus 11 is heard as a da 5% of the time. So in that case, these are two independent probabilities. I multiply them together to get the overall prob probability of these two events happening. So I multiply 80% by 5%, that gives me 4% overall. The other option for a same response is that both of the stimuli are heard as gauze. That will happen 20% of the time for stimulus nine, and it will happen 95% of the time for stimulus 11. So in that case, I multiply 20% by 95%, which looks like this, and my overall probability 
is 0.19% or 0.19 overall or 19%. As before, I have sort of two uh, mutually exclusive events here. So I add up their probabilities to get the overall probability of either one of them happening. And I can get a probability of same responses in this case being 23%. 4% plus 19% is 23%. Like I said, in this case, you respond either same or different. So if you're not responding same, you're gonna respond different. That means 100% of the time you get one of those two responses. The amount of different responses you get is 100% minus 23% or 77% overall. Uh, you can figure out how to get to that percentage by walking through the math like this, except with sort of different response categories here, like da, ga, or ga, da. It will lead you to the same answer. It should lead you to the same answer if you're doing the math right. It should lead you to an answer of 77%. That's basically how the math works for this. Um, and like I said, this is when you're using identification to get to the discrimination curve. This is what the core of your homework assignment is going to be about. So like I said, if you don't understand this yet, walk through it again and you'll get practice in doing it by, or you know, not necessarily by hand, but doing it yourself when you um, play around with the response data from class in the homework assignment. The crux of the matter here though, is what happens in categorical perception or what uh, the classic example or the results of the initial classic experiments on this phenomenon were. Uh, in this discrimination graph, which I showed you before, the solid line is the observed data. These are the discrimination responses that the subjects actually gave in the experiment. And the dotted line or dashed line here is the predicted data. So the dashed line is what you get when you use the identification results to predict what people should do in the discrimination task. Um, and what you might notice is that the actual results are a little bit better or higher in percentage uh, correct than what we expect from the identification responses. So um, this is sort of an example where you're kind of crossing category boundaries. It is a little bit easier for the listeners to do that than what you might expect. And even within a category boundary, especially here at the high end of the uh, stimulus scale where you're getting into the, like the gauze, uh, the observed data is a little bit better than what, or a lot better actually than what we expect from identification alone. So the idea with categorical perception is that the dotted line should match up pretty much exactly with the solid line. Uh, and that's what would happen if when you listen to one of these stimuli, all you're doing is kind of discarding the acoustic details and just giving a label to that stimulus. Um, since people have this sort of discrepancy between the observed data and the predicted data, that seems to su suggest that there's a little bit more going on in perception than just sort of labeling a stimulus and throwing away the acoustic details. Um, I'll let you think about that, what they might be listening for in that case. But for the original proprietors of the school of thought, it didn't really matter this discrepancy uh, wasn't a big enough of a deal for them to stop making their point. Uh, and their idea was that this is exactly what goes on when people perceive speech. They just lump it into a category where there are clear distinctions across category boundaries and within a category, everything is just perceived as the same. This was done in the 1950s when it was harder to do statistical analysis. You actually had to like look up tables in a book and do the math by hand and whatnot. Uh, so they didn't really run stats on this to see if there was significant differences between these two curves. If they would have, they probably would have found something, but they didn't. Uh, and their theories became uh, influential in spite of um, these discrepancies. Uh, and we'll talk about that more next time when we get into the motor theory of speech perception. But for our purposes, I want you to create curves like this for both our observed and our predicted data. Uh, from our class responses and then you can let me know what you think about whether they're matching up well with one another or not But again, I'll reiterate that the crucial idea behind categorical perception is that these two curves should match up with each other basically exactly and that uh, when people are listening to speech they apply or they sort of just suck in um, sort of gradiently different acoustic stimulus and plop it into a clear phonemic category and use the label of that category 
to do a discrimination task, to provide the responses for their um, discrimination task. Okay, I think I've repeated myself enough times at this point to hopefully get that point across. So I'm gonna stop there. And we'll talk about the implications of this theory for the motor theory of perception next time. So I'll see you then, but I will also make a little video for the homework to help walk you through how to do that. Uh, so you can stay tuned for that in our next episode. All right, see you then.